laptops still have free software someplace. Microsoft's network stack came from BSD. So in effect, it was free software. And about six minutes left. I'm going to tell you a story not related necessarily to free software, but it's a story that is a good story. The year was 1939, and Hitler was going across Europe. And there was a person in Austria who was Jewish and was very afraid of what was happening in Germany. So this person left Austria and went to England and actually got into the movie, the fledgling movie business in England. And then after a while, they moved to Hollywood, California in the United States. Now this person's parents, the father was a physicist, the mother was a biologist. This person was a real geek. But they tried to go to the United States government and say, can I help out in some way, technically, with this, with the war effort? And the government kind of said, no, we have everything in control. But what was happening was that the Germans had submarines. And the submarines were, were devastating the British Navy. And they had torpedoes, but the torpedoes went very slowly, and they left a stream of bubbles so that the enemy ship could see them and easily dodge the torpedo. Now, they had the thought of using radio to guide the torpedo towards the enemy ship. But the problem was, if the Germans intercepted the radio signal, they could jam it and actually turn the torpedo around and actually send it back towards uh, the ship. So this person got the idea that if you could change the frequency of the radio signal fast enough, but still coordinate it between the ship and the torpedo, that you could, you know, the Germans wouldn't be able to intercept the signal. But they had no real way of doing that. So this person was in California, and they met up with a man who used player pianos. And this man has set up a mechanism to take 16 player pianos that used rolls of paper to control the piano and control all 16 pianos with another roll of paper. So they coordinated when each one of the pianos was supposed to play. And they got together and they came up with the idea of using the piano roll to control the radio frequencies and to coordinate it between the torpedo and the ship that launched the torpedo. And they actually got a patent on this. And they submitted the patents to the War Department and said, you could use this to make it so that the radio signal would be undetectable. But unfortunately, it was difficult to put a piano roll inside the torpedo. And so they rejected this, but they kept it on the shelf, still thinking about it. Years later, the transistor was created. And people looked at this again and said, maybe we could do this now. But it was still a little bit too hard uh, and, and, great, and difficult to do it. Later than that, the integrated circuit was created. And once again, they looked at this. And now, it was technically feasible. It was technically feasible to change the radio frequency and, and keep it in sync. And this is what was used during the uh, first Gulf War to launch the missiles and guide the missiles directly to the spot. And the Iraqis could not jam the radio frequency or even detect that it was there. By this time, the two people that had made this patent were very old. In fact, one of them was dead and the other one was living in Florida. Shortly after that, the patents had expired and shortly after that, the government 
decided to declassify this method of doing this. And this became what we now call spread spectrum technology. It's a technology that's used in all cell phones. It's a technology that's used in Bluetooth. It's a technology that was used in Wi-Fi. And it all comes from that patent that was done in 1939. Now the interesting part about that is even though the technology was patented, these two people gave it away because they said this was for the good of the nation. They never got a single, pat single penny off of this initial patent. Now, the person I'm talking about still continued to go back to the government and say, can I help with the war effort? You know, I'm a very bright person when it comes to science. No, no, but you can help us raise money for the war effort by selling war bonds. And this person said, okay, I'll do that. I'm in the entertainment industry. I will sell war bonds. And they were very successful at selling war bonds. As a matter of fact, they raised more money selling war bonds than any other person during World War II. Because this person, at one time, was declared to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Her name was Hetty Hopper. And that is the rest of the story. Hi, my name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the Executive Director of Linux International. And we are here today to, to celebrate the 20th birthday of the Linux kernel. Now I'll give you a warning that a lot of the history you're going to hear today comes from my rather aging mind, and that I have an increasingly hazy memory and it's not guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be exactly accurate or even completely uh, complete. So if you're going to have a problem with this, you can leave now. But otherwise, I think you'll find it an interesting and entertaining talk. Now, I'm going to go back in time this talk because I'm going to go back to the first use of Unix. And actually, the first use of Unix in a protective security environment was in Istanbul in 1453 AD. There was a person by the name of Medhead the Conqueror and he had a harem of women and he used eunuchs to guard his harem. He had white eunuchs and he had black eunuchs. Well, maybe it wasn't spelled U-N-I-X, uh, maybe it was spelled differently, but they were eunuchs, nonetheless. <laughs> now, when we want to talk about free software, we have to talk about the real conception of free software. We have to go back to a birthday, talks about the birth of the child. But that starts with the conception of the child. And we all think of free software as something like this, tux with the penguin with uh, pa pasted up glasses, but when I was a student in 1969, I was actually using what we would might call free software. That was because in the period of 1943 to 1977, computers were rather huge and expensive. The first computer that I ever programmed was an IBM 1130. It ran one program at a time. It basically had no operating system you linked your device drivers directly into your program and then you ran your program inside the machine. Those are lights up there that could tell you what was happening inside the machine as well as sense switches that you could set that would control how your program worked. Now this had all of 4,000 words of memory and it had a one half, uh, sorry, it had a five megabyte hard disk drive, and this machine probably cost about one and a half million dollars in 1969, and that's when one and a half million dollars was a lot of money. Now, most application software of that time was written in source code, because there weren't enough computers of any architecture to justify creating a binary distribution. 
So you got the code at source and you compiled it. And if it, was, if it was software that you purchased, you would have a contract that you would sign that would say, I'm not going to put this code on anybody else's computer. But basically, because you had the source code, you could change it, you could fix your own bugs, and you could extend the software the way you wanted to. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a myth that is in the present day computing industry. And that's the fact that computer vendors try to lock in customers to their system by creating interfaces that were different from every other vendor. Believe me, folks, I was there. It didn't happen that way. We didn't sit around the room saying, oh, let's create this new interface that locks the customers into our computer. We were simply trying to create operating systems to let people use the computer to the maximum advantage. Because remember, compared to today, these machines were incredibly slow and had very small memories. So you wanted to, and they were very expensive. So you wanted to make them as efficient as possible for that particular job mix. So if you had a, 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 a computer that was going to be used for business, then you would orient it towards COBOL and batch processing, because that's the way the business worked back in those days. If you wanted to do scientific work, you would orient it towards Fortran, and you might have a time-sharing system, because that's how engineers worked back in those days. Or you would have something that was a real-time system, because engineers needed that to control a circuitry. So we designed these different operating systems to take maximum advantage of the hardware. If you could make the, the problem work 10% faster on a two and a half million dollar computer, that means it's worth, the, the solution's worth $250,000 to you. It's worth it, okay? And if it was true that we really were trying to lock people in by having different programming interfaces, then digital would not need 11 different operating systems on their PDP-11 to meet different needs. They could have locked their, pro their customers in with only one operating system. So I just wanted to clear that up and get that out of the way. Now, as I said, free software did exist back then. I was a college student in 1969. And I didn't have 100,000 US dollars to buy a commercial compiler. So there was this organization called DECUS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society. There were other ones like IBM Share, HP's Brainstorm, you know, different ones. And they would have customers who would write software to try and use these computers. These people were not professional programmers. These people were doctors, educators, scientists, farmers, lots of different people that would write software for their own use. This, by the way, oop, 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 sorry about that. Go back, back, back. That is the second computer I ever programmed, a PDP-8. That had 4,000 words of core memory. Uh, a couple years after that, I bought 64,000 words of core memory and I paid $128,000 for it. So you can see that even though this is a tiny little computer sitting on a desktop, it's still pretty expensive. And uh, so I would send away to Decus for a piece of software. I would pay $5 to have a paper catalog sent to me. And once I looked through the catalog of software, I might see a nice text editor for $5 and I would send away for it. Now $5 back in those days was still a lot of money because $5 would buy you five pitchers of beer. And I think that you would know that as a college student, you might have a, a conflict there, right? <laughs> text editor or five pitchers of beer. And I think you can see where I went, you know. <laughs> but the nice thing was that this was free software. 
So once I got the original paper tape that would hold the text editor, I could go to the school store, I could get some new paper tape, put it in my ASR 33 teletype, and put the tape I got from Dekus there, and it would automatically copy it. And then after I made five copies of it, I could sell it a copy a piece for five, you know, to my, to my students, to my uh, roommates, and I could make back my money. So I could have my text editor and my five pitchers of beer. Because I was, they were paying me for the service of making this editor for them. First of all, I tested it out to see it was a good editor, that it did what it was supposed to, and then I made the copies. And that was the service that I was providing to them. And this is a lot of what we do with free software today. Now, a lot of people would say, why didn't they sell the software? Well, selling software is very hard. You have to uh, test the software. You have to have documentation for the software. You should give support for the software. And these people were not professional software makers. And they had their real job to do. They were just writing this software to do, help them do their job. And then after it was written, they said, maybe I can give it to help somebody else. And then maybe when I go to a DECUS meeting, somebody will say, great piece of software, it really helped me out. Or great piece of software, let me help you make it better. Or great piece of software, let me buy you a beer. Or great piece of software, let me buy you dinner. Or let me give you a job. And a lot of these reasons are the same reasons why we write software today, free software. Let's see. Oh, by the way, I found a piece of that paper tape recently, and I calculated out how much it would be to have to store two terabytes of data. And it would be 10,000, wait a minute, no, 10,112,360 kilograms, and it would be 72,853 kilometers long, and it would take about 6,000 years for the ASR teletype to read it in. So I just threw that in there. Now, in 1969, in New Jersey, there were these two people at Bell Labs, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, who decided to write this little operating system called Unix. And they wrote it on a cast-off PDP-7 computer. This was something that was lying out in the hallway, and they pulled it into their lab, and Ken started to write Unix just for fun, just because he wanted to play this game called Space Wars that he liked. And he started to write his operating system, and other people from Bell Labs started to join in doing this. And the PP7 was a mini computer. Its price was still fairly large, but it was reasonable for the time uh, and for the use of Bell Labs. Now, Unix was, an, was one of the first operating systems that was written to be portable. It wasn't written to be portable originally. It was written in assembly language for the PDP7. But as the PDP-7 tended to be too slow, they went out and found a PDP-11. And when they ported it from the PDP-7 to the PDP-11, they had to rewrite the entire operating system in assembler once again. At that point, Dennis Ritchie said, this is too much like work, and he invented the language C. Then they rewrote the operating system again in C to make it what they thought would be portable. But then they, decided, then they put it into another computer and they found out that it really wasn't as portable as they thought. So they rewrote the operating system again into two parts. One was the same no matter what system you put it on. It did scheduling, memory management, things like that. And the other part was what they called device dependent. It was the device drivers and the things that were specific to a particular computer system. As they ported it from more, to more and more machines, they got better and better at making the operating system design portable. Now, the, the, the reason that being portable was good 
was because if you could have the same operating system on different hardware architectures, on different computers from different companies, that meant you didn't have to retrain your users every time just because they were using a different system. And you didn't have to do massive changes to your programs to get them to work across these different systems from different vendors. One more thing happened in 1969, little noticed by anybody except two people, Linus's parents, Linus Torvalds was born in Helsinki, Finland, and we'll see more about him later. Now Unix started to spread because they, they, were, they would give away, we turned the uh, damp down a little bit. Um, we started to get take it to universities because universities liked seeing the source code. They liked working on this little operating system and they started to help make it better. But Unix was not free. You had to pay the telephone company a license fee for it. And if you were not a university, if you were a company, or if you were a small technical college like I was at, it meant you had to pay 160,000 US dollars to, put, to get Unix. Remember, this is 1969. That much money, you could buy a very nice house. In fact, you could buy three of them. Now, if you wanted to put Unix on, an, on the second computer, it was another $160,000. On a third computer, it was another $160,000. This was a telephone company. They did not understand volume discounts. So then you would send away for this magnetic tape and you would get it, but along with the license that said, if you let your students take a look at this source code, they could become contaminated. And if they went to work for another company trying to rate another operating system and they inadvertently use some of AT&T's code or intellectual property, you could be sued. So Unix was not a free operating system. In addition to that, it went to the University of California, Berkeley, where they started working on a completely different kernel. It had a lot of the same portability and features of the kernel from AT&T, but they were actually doing a better job of creating this kernel than the people at AT&T. Now, about this time, the commercial vendors started to make commercial versions of Unix. And to get around the issue of having to pay $160,000 per CPU, they were creating binary-only copies. Because AT&T said, if you ship only binaries, you only have to charge $350 per CPU, not $160,000 per CPU. So these companies started to produce binary-only copies and, and send them out to their customers. But they didn't even call it Unix. Sun Microsystems called it Sun OS, and later on Solaris. Digital Equipment Corporation called it Altrix, and then later on uh, OSF1, and after that Digital Unix. All of the different Unix systems had different names, and when a customer came up and said, I want Unix, Sun would say, here's Sun OS. And the customers say, no, I want Unix. It was very confusing. And eventually also, there were some wars between different factions. Sun and AT&T on one side, calling, calling themselves um, Unix Systems Labs, and the Open Software Foundation being made up of Hewlett Packard, IBM, and Digital Equipment Corporation. And much stress was happening because of these wars going on. About the same time, 1977 to 1983, IBM was coming out with their IBM PC, and Apple was coming out with Apple II. CPM was already there, all of these were binary only distributions. And this was causing people to get away from using and understanding how to use source code and shipping source code. People became more and more used to it. Computer stores started to appear. 
Now, before this, you wouldn't have a computer store. There were no computer stores before 1977. Because if there were, you would need an 18-wheel tractor-trailer truck to haul your computer home. You need three-phase power to plug it in. And you need a 20-ton air conditioner to cool it. But after the PC and Apple II started up, people could go to a computer store and buy not only their computer, but boxes of shrink wrap software to run on them. Now, there was one person who objected to all of this. His name was Richard Stallman. He was a student at MIT. And he really liked looking at the source code for operating systems, and he liked having the operating system, and he decided to write a complete operating system in source code form and to make it freely available to people. Now, he could have started writing the kernel first, but that would have been a recipe for disaster because there have been a lot of people who would contribute to that, and after maybe five years, they would have nothing to, write on to run on top of that. So he took a different strategy. He wrote software that would go on top of the operating system and be useful. And he would deliver that software in source code form, but with the goal of having a complete operating system eventually. So the first program he wrote was Emacs. And there are some people who say he could have stopped with Emacs because Emacs is like an entire operating system. But he wrote Emacs, and people liked that. And then he went on to create the GNU compiler suite with GCC and Fortran and other languages. People liked that. And more and more people started helping him with his task of writing this complete operating system. And of course, there were other things out there that were freely available. Berkeley software distribution from the University of California, Berkeley, was available. Send mail as a mail transport system was available. The X window system came from MIT, a project called Project Athena. And all of these were free software under different types of licenses. The birth. So if you remember, uh, in 1969, Linus Torvalds was born. In 1991, he was now a university student at the University of Helsinki. And he had gotten a brand new IBM 386 PC. And Linus was a very smart student. And he knew that the operating system that came with that brand new 386 PC did not take advantage of all of the features of the Intel processor. Now, to be fair to the company that made that operating system, and I won't mention what their name is, <laughs> but they were still trying to support the 286, the 186, and these systems did not have the main feature that Linus was interested in, demand page virtual memory. So Linus knew that there were systems out there that, that took advantage of that, specifically Unix. But all the Unix systems that were out there were too expensive, and they didn't come with source code. So Linus decided he was going to write the kernel, do the kernel project just for fun. He didn't expect there'd be anything big or fancy. He just said, I'm going to do this just for fun, sends out an email message across the net, and other people start joining in and start working with him on this project. In the period of 1993 to 1994, the kernel was getting fairly good. And, and we began to have beginning distributions come out. One called SLS, Soft Landing Systems, was one of the first distributions, followed by Yggdrasil. Now these two distributions and Transameritech no longer exist. They were a little bit too early. They got diverted, they lost funding. However, one, Slackware, is still in existence today, and it's a very, very good distribution put out by somebody named Patrick Volkering and a staff and a crew of volunteers who work on that. 
Now, in early 1994, the kernel was good enough to become version 1.0. It still isn't like the kernel of today. It was single CPU. It only ran on Intel. It had a lot of, it didn't have any log-based file systems, but it was good enough that you could create an entire distribution and other distributions started to appear like Red Hat and others like that. Now, in May of 1994, we were going to have a DECUS meeting in New Orleans of the United States. I do not know how many of you have ever been to New Orleans, but it is the adult Disneyland. You can get anything you want in New Orleans and a lot of things you don't want. <laughs> but a certain gentleman by the name of Kurt Riesler was the head of the Unix Special Interest Group, it's kind of like a lug, inside of Decus, And he had heard about this person in Europe and this project, and he wanted this person to come to Decus to talk about it. And he kept sending out email messages to all these small companies that I mentioned and said, would you please help us fund this trip? And he would copy me on these email messages. And these companies would write back and said, we're very small, we don't have any money, but we'd be happy to give you CDs to give out to your members. After a while, Kurt was almost ready to give up. And I liked Kurt. He had good ideas. So I went to my management and I said, I don't know who this person is, and I don't know what he did. But I think, because Kurt has good ideas, I think we should fund this. And my management went to their management and they said, we don't know who this guy is, and we don't know what he did, and we don't even know who Kurt is. But Mad Dog sometimes has good ideas, so I think we should fund this. And we got 5,000 US dollars to fly this person from Helsinki, Finland to New Orleans. And then Kurt asked the really horrible question. He said, I need an Intel PC to run this software on. Now, I worked in the digital Unix group, and we supported VAXs, and we supported MIPS processors, and we supported alpha processors. We didn't support those weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs. But I got him one. I sent it down there. I flew down to New Orleans. I saw Kurt trying to install the software and having problems. And along comes this nice young man wearing glasses, sandy brown hair, wool socks with sandals, and said, can I help you? And Kurt says, yes, I think you can. And 10 minutes later, Linux was running on that PC. Now, this was the first time that Linus Torvalds had ever installed Linux off a CD. The way he installed Linux was to build the distribution on his second hard disk drive, boot that, and install it on his first hard disk drive. His PC didn't even have a CD-ROM. And they invited me to sit down and to try this out. Now, I am a fan of pianos and piano music. And I will tell you that when you play a piano, if the piano is well-tuned, you usually can get fairly good music out of it. But if you play a really, really good piano, all of the keys are perfect and weighted. And it is a pleasure to play that piano. This was like this operating system called Linux because I had used many Unix systems in the past, but when I used this, everything was in the right place. And it was like playing a really great piano, and even on a weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC, it still responded very nicely. And so I said to myself, what would happen if we took this operating system and put it into the Alpha, a 64-bit system, the fastest microprocessor in the world. And I got this idea that this operating system could actually be used for research in universities into large address spaces and how to use them. Now, for those of you who have never thought about this, 
A 32-bit operating system can hold 4 billion bytes of data in virtual memory. And that seems like a lot, unless what you're trying to do is edit the Lord of the Rings movie. Or you're trying to simulate a Boeing 747 airplane over its entire life. Or you're trying to do global warming studies. Then all of a sudden, 32 bits becomes amazingly small. But 64 bits is 4 billion times 4 billion. That means that you can store a gigabyte of data every second of the day, every day of the year, 24 hours a day, for the next 5,386 years and still not run out of address space. Or you can store 128 bytes of data for every square millimeter on the surface of the Earth, including all of the oceans. It's a lot of data. <laughs> And so I took Linus out on the Natchez, this steamboat, and we went up and down the Mississippi River drinking this wonderful drink called a hurricane. Now a hurricane is so powerful as an alcoholic drink, after you've had two of them, you feel you've been hit by Katrina. <laughs> and we're going up and down the river and I said, Linus, have you ever thought about porting Linux to a 64-bit system like the Alpha? He says, yes but they've been having trouble getting me one of these systems in Helsinki and I might have to do the IBM PowerPC instead. <laughs> and somebody told me that I actually dropped my drink on the deck of the boat and I never drop a drink, ever. <laughs> and I said, don't do anything rash because I'm gonna get you that alpha system. This is Letus back in 1994 going on board the Natchez along with an unknown person, okay? <laughs> now, people would tell you in business that the way you get some type of project done is that you write a proposal and you put down the justification and you send it to your management and they read it and they ask you questions and you change the proposal and you reread it, you rethink it and then it's, it's funded and budgeted and stuff like that. No. The way you get things done in a large corporation is you pull in favors. And I've been at digital for 16 years and there was a lot of people that owed me favors. So I called up my friend Jim Jackson and I said, I need an alpha system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away you don't know who this person is, and you don't know what he did, but I need that system. And Jim said, I happen to have one. 96 megabytes of main memory. Remember, this is 1994. Memory didn't cost $10 a gigabyte in 1994. 96 megabytes of main memory, 21 inch monitor with a 3D graphics card. It had a four gigabyte hard drive and a CD-ROM. 4X CD-ROM in it. The whole system cost about 30,000 US dollars. And Jim said to me, what are you gonna pay for? And I said, I'll pay for the shipping. <laughs> and then it got to Helsinki, Finland, and we realized we made a strategic mistake. We said it belonged to Linus instead of belonging to digital. So the Helsinki office had to pay $15,000 in duty to give it to Linus but he got his alpha system. I went back to my management finally and gave them a presentation about free software and Linux. And they said to me, why did you do this? And the last bullet on the last slide said, because Linux is inevitable. There's nothing that can stop it. And my management laughed at me. Today, every single one of those people works for Red Hat. Now, we started the Alpha Linux port in January of 1995. And I started to find out what the word community meant. People in the community went out and spent their own money to buy Alpha systems to help with this port. Particularly people like David Mossberger Tang, who helped to port the math library of, of Linux. And Richard Henderson, who single-handedly did 
created shared libraries for Alpha Linux, something that seven engineers working at digital, I'm sorry, 15 engineers working at digital for seven years had failed to do. He did it by himself. I began to see what community could do because in nine months, this people who had never met each other face to face had taken Linux from a 32-bit system, only Intel, a CISC processor, to the Alpha, which was a RISC processor and 64 bits. Now, in 1994, the world was having a problem. Supercomputer companies like Cray and ECL were starting to go out of business. They would create, they would spend millions of dollars to create a supercomputer and then they would sell five of them. And they weren't making enough money to keep in business. Now we need supercomputers for lots of things. So two people, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker of NASA, decided that they were going to create a different type of supercomputer. One made up of those weak, miserable, crappy PCs all hooked together with high-speed networking, and they called this concept the Beowulf system. And they found out that the Beowulf system could actually create the computing power of a mainframe supercomputer for one fortieth of the price. We're looking at it another way. For the same amount of money, you could get a supercomputer that was 40 times more powerful than the proprietary closed supercomputer. But, as a friend of mine named Pat Goda said, the real power of the system was that you could actually get applications for it because it used the same kernel that runs on my notebook. And the interfaces were the same as on my notebook. So actually you could get open office to work on the supercomputer. And this started to spread. Now what types of applications are we talking about? Image rendering, making movies and things like that. Image recognition, looking at photographs and determining what's there. Weather forecasting and global warming, data mining. This one of the biggest things that was is used in the genome research was MySQL on top of Beowulf systems. How many of you saw the Titanic or know of the movie? The Titanic used 160 alpha processors rendering the movie over an entire year. They could have used one alpha processor, but it would have taken 160 years and Leonardo DiCaprio wouldn't look as good as he does today. <laughs> How many of you saw Lord of the Rings? 1,024 processors working for an entire year to render that movie. Why so many? Because there's a certain rule of thumb that says the better the graphics, the better the imaging, the more computing power you have to use. And we as customers keep demanding better and better and better movies so they have to keep using more and more and more CPU power. Now, we even have a free software package to allow us to make 3D movies. And Blender is an example of that. It has Big Buck Bunny. How many of you have ever seen Big Buck Bunny? Great movie, okay? It's only 10 minutes long, but very good graphics, all done with free software, and all of the intermediate data is also available. So you can change the characters if you want to. You can change the ending. It's really great for teaching students how to make animated movies. You can also use Blender to make games. And they have made a game. And the game, too, is also free. Blender started as a closed source proprietary program. But the company that was making it went broke. And the community bought the software from the company and made it free and open. And now as a free and open project, it's doing fine. It's going forward. Now in 1996, I went to Sao Paulo, Brazil. I actually saw my first Beowulf system in real life. 
they were using it to do real-time graphics of Toy Story quality. So while Toy Story was rendered over an entire year to get the movie, they were doing the same type of animation in real time using this system. They were also using it to analyze mammograms, pictures of a woman's breast to see if she has cancer. On a Spark 20 computer system, it would take 20 hours to analyze the image. With the Beowulf system, it took 10 minutes. So you could tell the woman right there at the hospital, congratulations, you don't have cancer, or we don't know, there's a chance you do, you have to have more tests, or we're really sorry, you do have cancer, let's schedule the operation immediately. And if that saved even one woman's life, then the investment was worthwhile. Oh, by the way, this is the Gordon Bell Prize for supercomputing. It continuously is won by computers that run Linux. This is kind of embarrassing to Gordon Bell, who works for Microsoft in their supercomputing area. But he's a good sport about it. <laughs> Here is a supercomputer that was made at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. You can see you don't need very expensive PCs to do this. This is 48 PCs lined up with the keyboards on top. There's one that's fallen over. <laughs> and the highly sophisticated networking on the back. This is actually used to do real supercomputing work. And you could make these in your high schools. If you have a computer lab in your high school with your computers hooked together with Ethernet, all you have to do is put the right software on them and you too can have a supercomputer to allow your students to learn how to program this. Why is this important? Because we are now moving into the area of distributed applications over the network and multi-core systems, seven core systems, eight core systems. You need to learn how to divide up your, your data and your code. Now about this time, Linus Torvalds had graduated. It took him a little longer than most because he was busy doing things other than school. And he decided to move to Transmeta in Silicon Valley. And I was lucky enough to have known them for a time. I, have, I am the godfather of Patricia. That's Patricia there. That's Patricia. That's Tuve, Linus's wife. I'm the godfather of Patricia and Daniela, which is their second child. So I went out to Silicon Valley to show them around. And then slightly after that, the digital office in Helsinki, Finland, wanted to have a Linux day. But unfortunately, Linus was now in the United States. So they invited me to go over to uh, Helsinki, Finland, to talk to their customers about Alpha Linux. Now, this is the start of my traveling, talking about Linux. I've been traveling around doing this for the last 15 years, going around telling people how to make money with free software or save money with free software. How to have control of your software. Because if you don't use free software, then you are a software slave. And there's somebody who tells you when to upgrade your system, when to, you know, what to run your system on, what to run your software on, how many people can use your software. They tell you when you have to migrate off of that because they're no longer supporting it. That is like being a slave. Because when you're a slave, you're told where to go, what to do, who to marry, when to have children. So, if you don't want to be a software slave, you have to use free software. So I went over to Helsinki to talk about this. And of course, we had the normal uh, sauna fiesta that happens in Finland. After that, I went to Fiji, kind of from the, the cold north to the south. And in Fiji, I happened to visit the University of the South Pacific. Now at that time, the university was connected to the internet by one 1200 bit per second modem. So they had heard of Linux, but every time they tried to pull the kernel down, they would get halfway through, there'd be some storm in the South Pacific, the, the, the net would drop, and they'd have to start all over again. 
So I had a copy of a Linux distribution. It happened to be based on Red Hat. And I gave it to them. And as I was giving it to them, I had this thought. I've been a product manager of operating systems at that point for 10 years. I knew how much intellectual property was in that CD. And I was giving it to them for free. Two billion dollars at least was the worth of the intellectual property in that CD. And so as I gave it to the university, I felt a little bit like this. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> now, in September of 1998, we started to have database companies like Oracle and Sybase and Formix start to port because their customers were demanding it. And in October of 1998, companies like IBM started to recognize that Linux was a good operating system and free software was good for their business. Now, why would a company like IBM think like this? Well, in 1998, IBM did a very strategic thing. They sold off their notebook division, their ThinkPads, and their desktop division, which did desktop workstations, to Lenovo, a Chinese company. IBM sold that because even though they were making a profit on that, the profit was very small. And IBM could not survive on a small profit. They took that money and reinvested it by buying a company called Price Waterhouse Cooper. Price Waterhouse Cooper was a services company. And IBM doubled the size of their service department. Why? Because services have a high profit margin. Companies pay a lot of money for a good solution. And IBM was going to deliver that solution. Now when you try and deliver a solution with closed source software, you have two problems. The first problem is you have to pay a certain percentage of the money for the royalties of the software you're using. But the other problem is you can't change the software you've bought. And therefore, it's difficult to get the different packages of software to work together the way the customer wants it. With free software, not only did you not have to pay the royalty, so you can re-divert that money to either greater profits or lower the cost of the solution. And you can give a better value to the customer by making the software work together better. The customer will pay more for that. And IBM recognized this. IBM doesn't like free software because they like to sit around a campfire singing Kumbaya. Kumbaya, my lord, free software. You know, or the free software song that Richard Stallman sings. They don't, they don't do that. They're about money and profit and giving solutions to customers. And that's what they recognize, and that's why they support free software. Now, in the year 2000, embedded system companies started to use free software. Before this, embedded system companies would develop their own operating system. And they would also oftentimes have to create their own compilers. As they went from one chip to another, they had to create the compilers first, then the operating system. And this was very difficult. Now, in the year 2000, there was this other thing that started to happen. The internet started to connect these embedded systems. People started thinking about what would happen if my refrigerator could talk to my microwave. You know, I had this conversation, I, I, I interrupted this conversation in my own kitchen the other day. I went downstairs, my microwave said, refrigerator, what do you have to put in me? The re refrigerator said, I've got this loaf of bread. Microwave said, no, no, I've seen that loaf of bread, it's moldy, you're not putting that in me. You know, <laughs> but seriously, these devices are starting to talk to each other. In the United States, they have washing machines that you can look at over the internet to find out if your laundry is done or not. And the network stacks are very hard to do. So all of a sudden, embedded systems people said, wait a minute, we have Linux now. 
it already runs on all these different processors. It already has a great networking stack. And we don't have to pay a royalty for it. And it's secure. And it's stable. And it's multitasking. All the things that we need. And we don't have to pay a royalty on it. So almost overnight, Linux became the most used operating system in new embedded system designs. In March 2000, a lot of the dot-coms failed, but a lot of the Linux companies, like Red Hat, went even faster. Why? Because as people were trying to recover from this dot-com failure, they started to look at the real costs and the real savings, and they realized that free software would actually benefit them. And finally, in winter of 2003, Red Hat became profitable and other free software companies started to become profitable. So the people that say you can't make money with free software are either lying or just ignorant. Now, there's been a lot of Spanish distributions, both done in Spain and in Mexico. So you know, this is another advantage of free software, that free software, if you really want it to be in your language, you can go in and make the business decision about tra translating the strings to have it work in your language. We've had people in Mexico who have been really, really good and really, really great in the free software community. Miguel de Acasa from Mexico City. Federico, who's right over there, also from Mexico City, working on GNOME and other projects. And there's been many, many other people from Mexico and Latin America who have been very, very good in the free software space. Coming of age. Now, we've been talking about free software to this point, but in reality, there's also free culture. This, this lawyer, Lawrence Lessig of Stanford University said, what would happen if we take the concept of collaboration that we see in free software and allow a licensing technique to allow this collaboration to happen in the arts. Digital photography, you know, writing, textual writing, things like that. What would happen? Music. And so he created the Creative Commons, the way of freely licensing out your artistic work so that other people can build on it. And people started to develop business models around using Creative Commons and free licensing of their artistic talents. After that, open hardware. The open Moco phone, the Arduino. The Arduino is a little computer system. It's open hardware and open software. And people are starting to learn how to change this to meet their needs. So today, Linux runs on 98% of the top 500 supercomputers. Of the top 500 supercomputers, only one runs Windows, and they're paid to do it. <laughs> it runs on one half of all the server systems being shipped today. Now, a lot of server systems are mainframes, like IBM's MVS system, or Hewlett Packard's HPUX, or you know other ones. So Windows NT and Windows systems run on about one third of the server systems. And Linux is outselling Apple on the desktop. Now, Apple still has a larger installed base on the desktop, but today, if one Apple system on a desktop sells, there's more than one Linux system that's installed. So we're gaining market share. And in Android, Android is outselling iOS on handsets. Now, I want to point out something to you. Apple and Microsoft started at about the same time. But Apple had the strategy of creating everything themselves. And if you, if you wanted to sell something Apple, you had to be Apple. And after all these years, they have 9% of the desktop space. Microsoft took the philosophy of supporting everybody's thing. If you had a disk drive, you write a device driver for it, they'd support it. 
And that means that all of these people want to advertise Microsoft. That's why you see all these little Microsoft inside or supported by Microsoft signs on everybody's advertising. And Microsoft owns 90% of the marketplace. The same thing is happening with the iPhones. They had a head start, but with Android saying, we'll go on anybody's handset, and Android is now outpacing it. Why is this important? Because of applications. Application vendors will tell you, I can't put my application to your platform because your interfaces are bad, because I don't have the compiler I need, because the debugger I'm used to is not running there. And then you say to them, but well, we last, last week we shipped 120 million units. Oh, I was just kidding. We actually have our application running on your platform in the back room. We can stick it through quality assurance tonight. We'll be shipping tomorrow. <laughs> Volume is everything. It's not just something. It's everything. So now we come to the future. Notice my little penguin has a tie. That's because Linux is a commercial place in the marketplace. Year 2015, Nokia, who decided to use Microsoft on their phones, has given up, and they're going to be using Android. Project Kawa, a project I'm working on to create jobs and to make computers easier to use, I'll be talking about Project Kawa on Friday at 1 o'clock on the main stage. Please come. Uh, by the year 2015, we will have 1 million of free software systems administrators who are their own boss, who have their own business, and, and will be helping people use free software. Each one of those will be supporting about 300 clients. So 300 million thin clients will be using free software in Brazil alone, with 200 million more thin clients throughout the rest of Latin America. And Bobber admits to using GNU Linux at home. He says he's been using it for years, but he just didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> Year 2020, the newest GNU Linux supercomputer uses one trillion processors. And they realize that if they had to use Microsoft on that, it would cost about $35 trillion more just for the operating system. That's almost enough to fund a small war in Iraq. You know? and, and Linus is really now glad he's gotten rid of the big kernel lock because it would have been really bad. And Steve Jobs says that OS X wasn't used because they were holding their supercomputer wrong. <laughs> Year 2030, software patents are abolished, abolished around the world, especially in the United States, and they say, hey, it was really stupid. The Microsoft-Apple wars end because both companies go out of business and free software has triumphed. And finally, <laughs> Linus Torvalds decides to retire because it has been fun and is still fun, but he wants to have more time to do scuba diving. He passes his position to a Spanish-speaking protege, probably from Mexico, and they then, Linus will still act as an advisor. He goes on to join Mad Dog at the mmm place. <laughs> what is the um place? It is the year 2031, <laughs> Mad Dog's mansion and marina of math, music, movies, microcomputing, microbrewery, microwinery, microdistillery, and bait shop. <laughs> It'd be in a very nice place where the students could go barefoot year-round, and we're going to have them matriculate at different universities around the world, over the internet, sharing ideas at night, and sampling beer. And finally, in the year 2060, free culture brings about world peace. Now I'd like to take a little time to introduce some people to you. This is the future of computer science. 
This person in the upper right hand corner, his name is Eric Trowan. He is one of the three people that created Red Hat. Uh, he is now a multi-millionaire. He's riding on a robot that uses Linux as the operating system because it allows the robot's owners to write their own device drivers for things. This person here, his name is Mark Spencer. At the age of 19, he wrote a open source PBX system for telephony. It's called Asterisk. He started a company called Digium. It, it employs 350 people and thousands more around the world who are making livings installing his free software into companies that need PBX systems. He is a multi-millionaire. This person right here is not a multi-millionaire, but he started programming at the age of nine, was hacking the Linux kernel at the age of 12, writing device drivers at the age of 15. At the age of 19, he was a senior systems administrator for a small college. And at the age of 21, he was helping the Federal Bureau of Investigations capture people who were breaking into systems over the internet. At the age of 23, he was uh, helping the, the original creator of special effects for Star Wars movie do the next generation of special effects. And at the age of 25, he's doing PhD level work at the University of Washington on graphics and special effects. Did I tell you that he never graduated from high school? This person right here did graduate from high school, but at the age of 14, he created the first distribution that could install into the FAT file system without having to repartition the disk. He had sold 20,000 copies of it before his father found out what he was doing. His father said, why didn't you tell us that you were doing this? He said, I really didn't need your help. He then went on to the University of Ohio, got a degree in, in computer engineering, and runs his own company in Dallas, Texas. This person right here is from Soweto, South Africa. Soweto is a very, very poor black town in South Africa. And the government didn't think that there was anybody in Soweto who knew anything about free and open source software. As it turns out, this person was running his own consulting business using dial-up networking out of Soweto and was sending email to Linus Torvalds helping him debug a bug in the virtual memory subsystem of the AMD processor. It was because of this person and other people like him using free software that the government opened up a free software development center in the town of Soweto, South Africa. This is Federico again. And he started out at the age of 18 doing free software programming and has been extremely helpful, effective, and a leader of the free software community from right here in Mexico City. And this person I just met last week in Valencia, Spain. He created his own distribution at the age of 12, and now at the age of 15, he and his father have a business supporting that distribution. It's running in 20 countries around the world and has it's one of the few distributions that allow you to log in looking at your face as you log in. How are all of these people the same? All of these people are the same because they got where they are by looking and working with free software. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission. When you're working with free software over the internet, nobody knows how old you are, how young you are, whether you're male or female, black or white, from the USA or from Mexico, whether you're gay or straight, whether you're handicapped or not, all they want to know is, show me the code. And you can go as fast and as far as you want to go. Nobody stops you. So happy birthday to Linux. I've seen the birth of the computer industry and the birth of free software. I'm not the father of Linux. I'm more the godfather. But you are my godchildren. And 
If you want to see the most important person in free software, when you get up tomorrow morning, you look in the mirror. Because that person is you. The next time we have campus party, the next time we have campus party, I want each of you to take a Windows user under your wing. I want each of you to show a Windows user how to install Linux, that you can install it into a virtual machine on the Windows system. You can make it dual boot, anything you want. But you get them to take a look at Linux and you show them what it can do. And you get them, and then the next year, they will bring two Windows users under their wing. And after only 10 years, we will have world domination. <laughs> so this birthday is yours. And with that, I'll ask any, answer any questions. This has been kind of a fun talk. It's not technical or anything, but I'll be happy to ask any, answer any questions I can. And if I can't, I'll either tell you that I can't or I'll make up a good story. <laughs> If you don't want to, if you don't want to ask it now, I'll be over there for a little bit at my table, and I'm happy to have pictures taken, things like that. Thank you very much for coming. Ok, muchísimas gracias por estar en esta conferencia a los 20 años de Linux. Eh, John, I would like to give you a little rec uh, oh, yeah. well, I would like to thank you in name of Campus Party for being here and in name of the all of this community, free software community. And well, I think we're going to go ahead with the questions. Ok. Ok, eh, al, ¿quién tiene una pregunta para John? What about Creative Commons with the free software? What was the relation of Creative Commons with free software? I cannot. I don't. Don't you, men, you mention it that? Well, well, with free software, we have a variety of different li licenses that the people that write free software and, and what we call open source like to use. And each one of the licenses has a slightly different thing that it does. So one license is the Berkeley Software Distribution License, which allows you to change the software and create a binary-only distribution and not have to make the changes that you made visible to other people. Now, Richard Stallman feels, and I do, that this isn't a good thing. Because if you've taken the work of other people and change it only slightly, and then say, I'm going to make money off of this by selling a binary-only license, then basically what you've done is, t is you've gotten a right or a gift given to you but you're denying it to somebody else. And if you really want to create a binary only piece of software, write it from scratch. Don't, don't you know, utilize the work of other people to make money for yourself without giving back or at least allowing other people to have the same right that you had. So the four rights of the GPL license are the right to get the source code and read it, the right to change the source code, the right to extend those changes to whoever needs them, and the right to use the software for any purpose. The only right you don't have is the right to deny somebody else the same rights. And then there's another license called the artistic license. This is used by Perl. And what the artistic license says if you change the software and you distribute it, you're not allowed to call it Perl. You can call it Fred or Sam or, or Belinda, but you can't call it Perl. If you give your change back to the creator, Larry Wall, 
and he incorporates it into Perl so that the two pieces of software come together again, then you can call it Perl. And he does this to guarantee the quality of the name Perl. It's kind of like a trademark guarantees the quality of a company's product. So software has all of these licenses associated with it. But digital photo photography and music and things did not have those licenses associated with them. So Creative Commons created a set of licenses that could be applied to these things, which allow people to do much the same thing as is used with software. The right to distribute the digital or the, the art uh, to anybody that wants it with or without commercial benefit, with or without the ability to change it, with or without the ability to give credit back to the original author. And these are, you know, these licenses are very easy to apply to the artwork, which makes it easy for people who want to use it to use it. So there's also other artistic licenses that are out there, but those are the two mainstream uh, licenses. One for software, Creative Commons for like everything else. Next question, there's one over there. Okay, por cierto, las preguntas las pueden hacer en inglés o en español. Si es en español ahorita, ayudamos con la traducción. Do you think about uh, Oracle Take My Sequel? Larry Allison is not my biggest fan. I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of Larry Allison, okay, uh, or Oracle. Um, I think that Oracle is what we call in the United States biting their nose to spite their face. And they're going to find out that people will fork off my SQL, which has actually already happened. And, you know, he may lose everything he paid for by trying to do the types of stuff he's doing with Oracle and especially Java, okay? So I think that uh, Larry may, may have to be careful in that because the free software community has reacted in the past by forking projects and going off a completely different direction. Like with OpenOffice, creating uh, you know, uh, Libra software. So LibreOffice. So he may lose his entire investment if he isn't careful. Thanks. Hi. Because uh, Linux uh, out many different versions about in a year, it's too complicated admin this, uh, it's like uh, Hamlin say, update or not update. Well, you know, one of the things that the companies have to understand, is, well, actually, and maybe the whole audience should understand, is in an enterprise environment, you hardly ever had only one operating system. A lot of times you had a combination of systems that were proprietary, like MVS, you had Solaris, you had, you had Windows systems. So most administrators in enterprise environments are used to working with multiple operating systems at one time. The, the, thing, the other thing is, in a large corporation, you would say you would standardize on a particular distribution. So you might be using just Red Hat, or you might be, you know, for Linux, or you might be using just SUSE, or just Debian. So that, in a, in a, in a company, that makes that a lot easier, or in a school. The school says, we're going to standardize on Red Hat or SUSE or one of the other distributions. Now, if you don't do that, well then, you deserve everything you get. But the other side of this is that we do have a standard called the Linux Standard Base. And this is particularly for application vendors. So that they say, it's, tr it's hard for me to support all these different Linux distributions. But if they write to the Linux Standard Base, then they will, they will be able to put their application on distributions which are Linux standard base compatible. And therefore their, dis, their application will run. So we have looked at that and from an application standpoint, we have fixed the problem. Uh, from a systems administration standpoint, 
I would recommend that you standardize on a particular distribution. Now, the nice thing is, let's say one day Red Hat goes out of business. If Microsoft went out of business, what are you going to do? There's no other Microsoft develop, you know, companies that develop Windows. And you may not ever see the source code, so you're kind of stuck. But if Red Hat was to go out of business, number one, you would have the source code for the distribution. Number two, there's sent OS, and you could use that. Number three, you could go to a different Linux distribution and still maintain your investment in your applications and in a lot of the training and everything that you've got. The distributions are not that much different in reality. So you're much better off than if any company went out of business with their proprietary operating system. Next question. Hmm. Uh, first of all, uh, I gotta say, uh, I think I'm talking about, I'm talking for all the people who's here by saying that you are an inspiration for us. Thank you. Uh, down my question. Uh, what do you think about gaming on Linux? Um, creating gaming, games on Linux is pretty hard. Uh, no. Well. <laughs> okay. Convincing gaming companies yeah, to that. port to Linux is hard. That. Why is that true? Yeah. Okay. Thank I'm you. a game. Remember I talked to you about volume is everything? Volume is everything, right? Okay. How many of you are gamers? How many of you pay for your games? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> gamers, okay. Let's talk about software piracy. Brazil pirates 84% of their software. China pirates 92% of its software. Vietnam pirates 96% of its software. The United States, the richest country on the face of the earth, pirates 34% of its software. Now, why does Vietnam pirate so much? It's because the average person in Vietnam makes four US dollars a day. But that's enough to be able to feed a family of four people and house them. These same people are told you need to be on the internet to run your business. You need to have software to run your business. You need to have, so they go out and they get a cast off computer. That's pretty easy. But then all of a sudden they find out that they have to pay $200 for a new copy of Microsoft's operating system and then $400 for a copy of Microsoft Office. Now $400 of course is 100 days of working and earning money without having to buy, being able to buy food or clothing or housing. And then when you pay the $400, you get this shiny plastic disc. And these people are not stupid. They, don't, they know it didn't cost $400 to make that shiny plastic disc. Because they can go down to their friendly neighborhood software pirate and buy the same thing for 20 cents. So that's why they're software pirates. And if I was in their boat, I'd put a patch on my eye and go, ar, 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 baby! <laughs> so that's software piracy. And the thing is, these game vendors, believe it or not, would like to eat. They'd like to be paid for their games. And you guys don't like to do that. You like to buy one copy and share it with your 53,000 friends. <laughs> now, Microsoft owns 90% of the desktop, right? That means that of, of the 1.5 billion desktop systems in the world today, Microsoft owns approximately 900,000 of them. Maybe more, probably more. That means that if a game sells into 2% of the Windows, they might be able to sell 9,000 copies, okay? But Linux only currently has about 3.8% of the desktop. And you know the other problem with Linux people? They believe the software should be free. They believe they shouldn't have to pay for it. So now it's a double whammy. Not only do we have a very small market, but you guys don't want to pay for anything. <laughs> and you want to pirate. <laughs> and you pirate and not pay for it. So that's the problem. 
the, vent, the, the game vendors don't see a market to do it. But now we have Project Kawa. Ah. Project Kawa is going to try and dramatically reverse those numbers. Project Kawa in Brazil, we're going to have about 2 million systems administrators and 400 million desktops. A desktop at home for everybody and a desktop at work or a desktop at home and a desktop at school. These desktops will also be wireless mesh repeaters. So all of you people who want to use your cell phone as your interface will now be able to download data at 300 megabits a second. Yes. Do you know why you can't make a 3G telephone call in New York City anymore? It's because everybody that has iPhones is too busy downloading porn. <laughs> you try and make the telephone call, you can't make the telephone call because everybody's downloading porn. So you have to go back to 2G to make the telephone call. And the secret here is, despite what everybody's saying, oh, wireless this, wireless that, wireless this, guess what? There is a limit to how much wireless can carry, particularly in a particular area. You prove this at campus party every year. You know, Telefonica comes in or, 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 or movie, what, what is it? It's oh, Movie Star. Movie Star comes in and says, this year, we've done it. This year, we've got enough wireless stuff in here to take care of all the campus areas. That lasts for about 20 seconds. <laughs> you guys start downloading porn, just wipe them right out. And the answer is that you're all here in a very dense space downloading porn. And you're overloading the airwaves. And the secret of how you fix this is you make much smaller cells so that there's only one or two people downloading porn in each one of those cells. And then you can download porn at 300 megabits a second. That's what we're going to do with Project Kawa. And then when we have those 400 million desktops, they will say to the, to the game players, hey, it's true you only get to hit 1% of those 400 million. And then they'll port. Next question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, do you agree to private software enter to Linux? Uh, I, uh, for example, I'm a visual producer. And in Linux, uh, I use um, Ubuntu. There, in Ubuntu Studio, there are not enough or powerful solutions to edit video for me. Uh, and so I have to install Windows because uh, there's the Adobe uh, Creative Suite. And By I the way, do you, do, you, do you pay the $1,300 for no, that? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't pay for it. But, uh, for example, in Linux, PTV does not get enough power to, to make a lot of people get there. So, uh, if Adobe gets to Linux, would you agree all those enterprises get into uh, open source software? You see, I'm a, I'm a slightly different person than Richard Stallman. I love Richard Stallman, I really do. But see, if this is the line from being liberal left wing and being conservative right wing, and over here is Ronald Reagan on the far right, and over here is Richard Stallman on the far left, Richard has his arm wrapped around this tree of free software. And as much as people want to pull him into the center, he hasn't budged a single inch in all the years I've known him. He is so strong on this, he will pull Ronald Reagan into the center. And Ronald Reagan is dead. <laughs> now, I'm different. I, you know, if somebody says, I need a binary-only package to do my work, I've looked at all the free software stuff, I've legitimately determined it won't work, and they want to use a binary package on it, it's their choice, I do not spit on them. I do not spit on people that need binary device drivers. You know, I hope that we have open source device drivers. That's the goal. 
But in the meantime, I don't spit on those people. But as another side of this, the, the space of graphics and everything has come a long way. You know, folks, I hate to say this, but most of you are young. I am old. I have patience. I have seen this stuff happen time and time again over the last 40 years. I am patient. I know that Linux is inevitable. Free software is inevitable. Proprietary software is actually doomed. Why is it doomed? There's one and a half billion desktop systems, but there's seven billion people on the face of the planet. That means that 5.5 billion people have not selected their operating system yet. And these people are typically not rich, white, Anglo-Saxon, Western European, United States, male business people. These people are poor, they speak languages, not of the top 50, and they need to be able to change the software to work the way they work. The Swahili people had no word processor, no office suite that they could use in Swahili. And it wasn't easy to create one because it wasn't simply replacing a string with another string. Why? Because the Swahili people, the word download meant taking a box off the back of a truck and putting it on the ground. That was download. <laughs> they had no concept of what download meant in the computer space. But with open office, they were able to change the strings and do the work of creating the, the idea of download. So Swahili people now have a word processor that works in Swahili. This is what can be done with free and open source. It takes the control of the software away from a company and puts it back in your hands. You can make the decision to use the software the way it comes off the internet, or you can make the decision to change the software to meet your needs. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. And if you don't have the skills to do that, you can make the business decision to pay somebody else in your economic realm. The person in, in Vietnam cannot afford to pay a US programmer $400 an hour to make a change. But they can give a six pack of beer to a Vietnamese university student to have them do the same thing. That's their economic realm. And that's where free software shines. It's in the other 5.5 billion people on the face of the planet. And when I talk about volume is everything, I'll gladly give Microsoft all 1.5 billion if I can have the other 5.5. Next question question of way in the back. I'll give Steve Jobs two or three hundred. <laughs> okay. Hi, John. Uh, actually, I study in, uh, engineer, uh, chemical engineer, science, chemistry, uh, physics, and stuff like that. Um, the question is, what Linux, what Linux distribution or free software do you recommend to not huge fan, fans to Linux expert um, or, or to Linux expert like me? For example, I use MATLAB and Excel for math calculation. I would use a distribution called Poseidon. It's created in Brazil by a bunch of universities specifically oriented towards engineering, mathematics, and statistics. And, I'm sorry, you used Excel for, for doing what? Uh, calculation, for example, I don't know. Um, There's mm. R, a statistical package, which is very good at doing uh, types of statistical calculations. And of course, there's spreadsheet, the different types of spreadsheets for doing that type of stuff too if you use Excel. What? Okay. You asked me a question, I answered it. <laughs> uh, 
And the question is, um, what uh, Linux distribution or free software do you rank? Um, the distribution is called Poseidon, and it's created out of Brazil. It's a distribution that's specifically <laughs> oriented towards scientific and engineering and mathematical things. Could you repeat? Again? Poseidon. It's the ancient god of the sea with the pitchfork. Okay. okay. Poseidon. <laughs> Google it. Okay. Poseidon I, Linux. I understood. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I know I talk funny. I come from New Hampshire. Another question? Uh, John, uh, about uh, five years ago or so, you made a, a, a statement about the business growing in the VoIP, and, and you, you made a comparison to the business being made at the time with the, with the whole Linux industry. You made a prediction that the, there was going to be uh, more money in VoIP, like uh, using open source software like Asterisk than in the whole uh, Linux industry. Absolutely. Yeah, can you give us an update about it? Yes. Okay, so the, the, the statement I said was there's, there's going to be more money to be made in voice over IP and in telephony than in the rest of Linux put together. And I still believe that. Uh, I'll modify it slightly to say that we shouldn't be talking about voice over IP, we should be talking about communications over IP, which means TV over IP, radio over IP, and Facebook over IP, okay? Because these are all communications. We are a, a, a world of people who want to communicate, okay? And yes, we're using computers to do it, but you know, we have to think about what we really like to do. We like to talk. We like to listen, okay? We like to talk more than listen. But this is, this was a huge thing of being able to create, the, the, the thing that inspired this was asterisk, to be able to create a PBX system, a private branch exchange system that normally would sell for at least 30,000 US dollars and go up from there so that you might have to pay 200,000 US dollars or more. And then if you went back five years later to expand it, you found out the company you bought it from had gone out of business. Or they were no longer making that particular system and you had to revamp the whole thing. And Mark Spencer made something which was free and open source to allow you to take a cheap PC with a couple of internet card, a couple of cards in it, to make a thirty thousand dollar PBX system. But it was more than that. You could then tie your sugar CRM system into your asterisk system. So when the customer picked up, when, you, when the customer dialed you, you would find out who the customer was from their from their uh, ID, and go in and pull up their records and bring them up to your screen so that you have the information right there in front of you. Oh yes, Mr. Hall, you're calling about the order you put in yesterday that I see just shipped and just arrived on your shipping dock. It's there on your shipping dock. I can see from your FedEx account. This cuts down the amount of time and effort of doing business dramatically. And you can do this because the software is free and open. It was in Mexico City five years ago that I was at a conference that had to do with all types of software, but I happened to mention asterisk. And I talked about creating an application that used Sugar CRM. I, I went away for a day, I came back to the conference, and as I was going through the trade show floor, this man called me over. He said, I listened to your talk yesterday. I happened to use asterisk and overnight, I created the application that you were talking about in the, in the conference. And he showed it to me, and it worked. Overnight, he did that. This is the power of free software. And it gives you the way. I don't talk about the cost of free software anymore. 
you hear a certain company who will talk about the total cost of software, the total cost of solution, and they'll say, oh, free software has the same total cost of ownership as proprietary software. Because proprietary software, you pay a royalty on the software, but the support costs are less because, believe it or not, you pay a Microsoft closed source support person less money than you pay a free software person. Free software people demand more money than Microsoft support people do. You, you people are a little bit, you're, you're a little bit harder to find and you have a lot more knowledge. So the total cost of ownership over a five year period is the same. But I don't care because that's not what we should be talking about. We should be talking about return on investment. What is the value of the solution? If I save a company two million dollars a year, what should they pay me to give them that solution? I have done this. I've walked into companies. I say, how much does it cost you to do that? They say, $2 million a year. How much will you pay me to fix that problem? I'll pay you $500,000. Fine. I write 12 lines of Perl code, $500,000, please. They say, wait a minute. You've only been here half a day, and you wrote 12 lines of Perl code. Why should I pay you $500,000? You don't pay the surgeon for the 10 minutes they're in the operating room. You pay them for the 38 years that it took them to find out where to make the cut. Earlier, we were talking about software piracy. I'm going to tell you why you should not, you should fight software piracy at every step. I go to Brazil and talk about the value of free software. And I say, you know, I used to say, because the software is free. And they say, Mad Dog, all of our software is free. <laughs> Piracy devalues the value of software. It devalues the work that you guys do. And if everybody thinks it's okay to steal software, then how are you going to make a living? You know, that's why software piracy is bad. If everybody paid for the software like they're supposed to, then more people would use free software because they would see the monetary difference. But I don't care. Because with free software, I can give you a better solution. I can give you one that will make more money. I'll give you one that will differentiate you from your competitor. Uh, there was a small company in Rio de Janeiro. They were investigating the rainforest for new materials, new medicines and things like that. But they needed software known as Geographical Information Software, GIS. And the one company in the world that made really good GIS software is a company called Esri. They sell their software for $500,000 a copy. And this company needed nine copies. They had the $5.4 million to pay Esri but the problem was the software was only in English and the little company only spoke Portuguese. Now can you imagine that? Somebody that couldn't speak English. Ah, uh, must be really dumb, right? <laughs> so the little company said to Esri, look, we're going to be paying you $4.5 million for these nine copies of your software. Couldn't you make it prompt in Portuguese? And Esri said, no, it's not in our best business interest, meaning Esri's best business interest. So a little company went to a free software developer and said, we don't need all the functionality. We just need this little bit. Can you do this with free software? And he said, yes, I can. I'm going to use Postgres to store the data. I'm going to use OpenGIS as a GIS software. I'm going to use GNU plot to plot out the maps. I'm going to use Python to hook it all together. It took him three months, and he charged him $380,000, as well as a little bit every month for a maintenance fee. So now the question. How valuable was this software? 
Now, some people might say the value of the software was $380,000, because that's what the guy charged for it. But that's not the right answer. Some people might say the value is $4.5 million, because that's what the company, that's what the little company would have to pay Esri for the software. But that's not the answer. That software was infinitely valuable, because without it, the little company couldn't exist. And that's the difference between cost of software and value of software. And I'll tell you, this is the best piece of news, the best piece of information you'll get in all of Campus Party. Do not sell your software for the cost of it. Sell it for the value of it. Do not sell your services for the cost of it, not time and materials. Sell it for the value of it. If you can't, make, if you can't do work that's more than your, the, the expenses you need to live, then you should go on to a different type of business, a different type of software. You should be able to make a great living with free software because the value of it is spectacular. And you have to find the jobs and opportunities that let you make that money. Don't sell your services for minimal amounts of money because what you'll find is that they'll keep driving you down and down and down until you won't be able to make a living at all. That is the recipe and the road to disaster. Okay, next question. In the back. my bad English but I really I, there's something there's one thing I really mean to know about you and that's your opinion about uh, software patents in Europe and here in America you know once upon a time I used to think the software patents were good and then I thought software patents were at least neutral but over the years I have realized the software patents are actually evil I know, I know. The devil created them, and they are evil. <laughs> Most people don't realize that the United States Constitution is not about freedoms. Freedoms are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States is really about making money. If you take a look, it created a national bank, a national militia to protect our enterprises, it eliminated taxes between the states. And in Article 8 of the Constitution, it created the Copyright and Patent Bureau. Yes. And the open the, source? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Patents. But, the open source? But in the Constitution, it said, we're doing these to help advance the arts and science. It did not say, we're creating this to make multi-billionaires. It didn't say, we're creating this to block the way forward. Now, for many years, copyright and patents did not apply to software. In fact, it was only in, 1980s, in the mid-1980s that software had copyright and patents applied to it. So there's a lot of people that say, we need copyrights and patents to, to, to have innovation Let's look at the innovation that happened before copyrights and patents. Machine code, assembly language, high-level languages, real-time operating systems, time-sharing operating systems, batch-oriented operating systems, virtual memory, you know, all these things, windowing systems, all this stuff, all happened without patents. Where we get after patents? A stupid talking paper clip that everybody hated. <laughs> That's the only innovation I ever saw, okay? And, and when it comes to patents, you have to think about Michelangelo. Michel oh. First of all, do you know how long patents have been around? The written patent actually existed in, in Florence, Italy in the year 300 AD. 
No, I'm sorry, 1300 AD. 1300 AD. In 1700 AD, the piano was created in Florence, Italy. But the creator of the piano said, I'm not going to patent it. Because if I patent it, nobody will ever buy one. If they buy one, if they don't buy it, there'll be no music for it. If there's no music for it, there'll be no way that anybody will want to buy it. So instead, he published how to make a piano. And people in Germany saw this and said, we can make these. And they gave away samples to the musicians of the day that you may have heard of some of these people, Beethoven and Mozart. Now, let's think about Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. Painting, 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 lying on his back, 20 years, painting, painting. In the end, in comes his arch enemy, Leonardo da Vinci. It says, beautiful masterpiece, but you have to start all over again, because last week I patented that brush stroke. And Michelangelo goes, what brush stroke? And, Leonardo, and da Vinci says, that one. It doesn't make any difference where he points, because if you have 60,000 brush stroke patents, how are you going to keep them all straight? Or Beethoven, who wrote Ode to Joy in the Ninth Symphony, one of the most beautiful pieces of music of all time. He's <laughs> going away. You know, he stops. He cannot hear the audience behind him wildly applauding because he's deaf. In from the aisles comes his arch enemy, Handel. He signs the Beethoven, beautiful symphony, maestro, but you have to start all over again because last week I patented the triplet. <laughs> How can you write music if you have to worry about, about triplet patents? And how can you create art if you have to worry about brush strokes? And how can you create software if you have to worry about 60,000 software patents? The world is no longer sailing ships. 13 original colonies. We're now in a different situation and the way we move the sciences forward now is collaboration. We need to get rid of software patents completely. That's how I feel about them. Thank you, thank you. Next question. Sorry, I'm so unpassionate about these things. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming. Muchísimas gracias por haber estado.